So thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Francois, I work at Mozilla. I'm a security engineer on Firefox. And today what I want to talk about is a little bit of a wish list for me. There are things, there are things that, I that I wish the web would do by default. Uh, there are things I wish we would ship in Firefox by default. But for one reason or another, it's actually hard to move the web forward when it comes to security and privacy because basically we can't have this all the time, right? We can't break websites because if we break websites, then people switch to a different browser, right? And if we lose all of our users trying to make them more secure, then we're not actually making anybody more secure. So it's a little bit of a, of a difficult game um, on the web to actually try and fix the historical bad defaults that we may have accumulated over the years. But uh, we're doing our best. And because uh, you are all power users, I can share a lot of hidden settings that we have that you can enable in your browser to make things a little bit safer uh, or a little bit more private. So hopefully there will be a couple of things that you can take away from this talk and use in your everyday browsing. I'm going to talk about sort of three uh, categories. The first one is features that I like to enable in my browser features that are not enabled by default. <coughs> then features that I choose to disable, often because I don't think that the trade-off of functionality to security is worth it, or just because I don't use these features. You may use these features, in which, in which case I recommend not disabling them, but uh, this is what works for me. And then finally, the last section is about features that I don't want to disable entirely, but that I choose to restrict because they may leak more information about me than I'm willing to share, or something like that. Now, what I'm going to talk about applies to both the desktop version of Firefox, but also to the Android version. So if you have an Android phone and you install Firefox, you can use almost all of the settings that I'm going to talk about today. A little bit of a warning. This talk is not going to teach you uh, about eliminating all sources of fingerprinting. If you don't know what fingerprinting is, it's pretty simple. A fingerprinting is the ability to uniquely identify you without storing anything on your computer. So the typical way that people track you online is with cookies. You've all heard of cookies, I'm sure. They set the unique identifier in your computer, and then your computer just hands it over to the websites as you visit them again. Fingerprinting doesn't work like that. You don't need to store anything on the browser. You just look at characteristics of the browser. For example, you may be located in the US. You, maybe you've set your, your browser to the German language. Maybe you've set your time zone to the Pacific time zone. Or you know, maybe you run Linux as an operating system. Now, none of these things identify you uniquely as a person. But if you combine all of them, you start to narrow it down quite a bit. And so that's the idea behind fingerprinting. And in order to eliminate fingerprinting entirely, you have to basically turn off the browser entirely. Uh, it's really difficult. Um, there are approaches to, uh, to defeat fingerprinting, but it's, it's really, really difficult. Every, anytime we, we add more functionality, there's a, there's a risk that we make the browser a little bit more fingerprintable. If you care about this, if you care about strong anonymity, you should not be using Firefox, basically. You should be using the Tor browser. They specialize in this. You know, if, you, if you have some whistleblowing activity to do, yours, use the Tor browser, don't use Firefox. Um, this is uh, the kind of stuff that they do. They, they look at the security uh, functionality trade-off in a completely different way than we do. Um, also, Tor is based on Firefox. So you're still using Firefox if you're using Tor. So let's start with the features I like to enable. The first one that I'm going to mention is tracking protection. Tracking protection is enabled by default in private browsing in Firefox. Um, and what it does is that it blocks known trackers. So companies that are known to track you, we just block them. We have a curated list in the browser. And that's what we do. If you want to enable it outside of private browsing, enable it all the time, then you need to go into the special settings section in Firefox, which if you type the URL about colon config, you'll get this uh, nice little warning. With, uh, and then you click through this. And then you have access to all of the uh, settings that I'm going to talk about today. And this particular one is privacy to tracking protection dot enable. If you turn that on, then you have tracking protection everywhere uh, in your browser. So not just in private browsing. And if you're curious to see what uh, lists we're using, 
uh, we rely on a company, a privacy company called Disconnect. They curate a list of trackers, and that's what we ship in Firefox. It's all available publicly on, on, GitHub, on GitHub if you want to know exactly what's in there. Um, if you want to know more about the details of how tracking protection works, um, I wrote a blog post about it that you, uh, where you find, you'll find all of the gory details. Um, and you can get the slides later and click on the links if you want. Now, another feature that I like to enable is something called Do Not Track, or just <laughs> DNT. Uh, do Not Track is very different from tracking protection. Tracking protection actually blocks network connections, right? Do Not Track is completely different. It sends a signal to s websites that you don't want to be tracked. So you're essentially kind of opting out of their tracking that they probably do by default. So it's up to the site to ignore or honor that signal. Right? That signal is sent as a request header, and most people just disregard it entirely. Mm -hmm. right? But there are a few uh, companies that do something different when they see this. If you want to enable it, it's uh, in the security settings. Uh, or you can just do it in about config using privacy.do-not-track.enabled. And the reason why I think it's useful, even though most companies ignore it, uh, especially ad companies, is that there are a couple of big sites that do honor it. They do something different when they see that you have the do not track uh, flag set. So Medium, Twitter are two uh, well-known examples of that. So I think it's worth uh, doing, even though it's definitely not uh, perfect. So let's talk about a couple of features that I choose to disable instead. So those are things that are enabled by default in the browser and that you may want to consider disabling uh, if you're like me. The first one is DRM. Now, if you're here, you probably hate DRM too. Uh, DRM is incompatible with freedom, democracy, all of these things that we uh, tend to value in this community. Um, so I disable that mostly for philosophical reasons because I think DRM is not something that we should have. If you want to disable it, it's accessible in the settings under content, play the RM content, and or in the about config. Uh, it, is, it maps to this pref. As soon as you disable it, then the browser will remove any uh, DRM modules that you may have installed automatically. So for example, this one is Widevine. That's the that's DRM module from Google. Now, I say that I do this mostly for philosophical reasons, because in Firefox, unlike all of the other browsers, I think, the DRM module is actually heavily sandboxed. It's a proprietary module that comes from a different company, but we have limited the API surface that it has with the browser. So it's very limited as to what it can do, how it can interact with your browser, and what kind of information it can read uh, from your browser. So there's not really any security concerns and leaving that enabled. But I think um, if you're here, you probably want to get rid of it too. So that's how you do it. Something else that is built into the web platform is the ability for web pages to access certain sensors that are in your devices. So for example, in all phones, there is a gyroscope that allows the phone to figure out what orientation it has. and Sometimes it helps with uh, indoor um, location data, that kind of stuff. So a gyroscope, however, it turns out, can pick up sounds or sound vibrations. And there are some researchers that have figured out a way to actually turn a gyroscope into a microphone mm -hmm. if you have uh, in enough uh, resolution there. Um, that's a little bit worrying. I don't personally care about web pages being able to tell what orientation my phone is in, so I choose to disable that. Another sensor that um, is available to web pages is something called the ambient light sensor. And that allows a web page to figure out, for example, that it's dark in your room, so maybe it'll change the color scheme or something like this. This is the sensor that uh, also detects on your phone that your uh, face is right next to the phone, so they may as well turn off the screen because you're obviously in a phone call and you're not uh, looking at the screen. Uh, or in a laptop, it might adjust the backlight to uh, turn it um, a little bit brighter if, if you're in direct sunlight or something like that. None of these things I particularly care about in my web pages. Um, don't really care if the color scheme is not quite right uh, and when it's uh, you know, dark or something like that. Um, and it turns out there's a really clever attack where you can use the ambient light sensor to essentially read off information on web pages that the page is not supposed to be able to read. Um, so this is 
a pretty worrying attack. We're in the midst of figuring out whether or not that API should exist in the first place. And uh, you know, should we fix this or should we just remove the API entirely? Um, I choose to disable it. You can disable both sensors using uh, that preference in Firefox. Yes. So, so with this, you're saying the sensor can sort of act as like a very low resolution camera looking at the screen, in a sense? The, so the idea of this attack, the question was like, how does the attack work, basically? Is it a very low resolution camera? Um, I think, I think the, the, the way that the attack works is that you have to like enhance the contrast of certain things, and then you can kind of like only read one bit at a time. So it's not, it's not like, you know, you can like point the, cam the camera down <laughs> and actually look at the web page itself. Uh, it's, it's quite a sophisticated attack. But if you can leak like one bit of information that you're not supposed to read, you can probably repeat the attack and read more bits. And you know, if you, if you run it for long enough, you can you know, read like the whole page eventually. Like that, that's, that's the idea. When we have these kinds of flaws, we're taken very seriously. Uh, even if it's just like you can tell one bit of information, like that could degenerate into a, a much bigger attack. Um, but yeah, it's very easy to turn off all of these sensors like this. Another one that I choose to disable is the Web Audio Processing API. Now this is something different from playing audio on web pages because obviously playing audio on web pages is quite useful. If you go to YouTube and you don't have any sound, that would be unfortunate. Um, this is a different API. This is about some, some kind of sophisticated audio processing stuff. Um, and I have not seen, I've not encountered a website using that personally. Um, but there are uh, tracking companies that actually use this API to fingerprint you. And the reason uh, they do this is that if they do some kind of um, audio processing on your machine, then it will be slightly different if you look at the very, uh, you know, like it, the, the last couple of digits of some kind of uh, computation or something like that. Then every sound card is a little bit different. And so you, but, it's, it, it, but it will be the same if you perform the same uh, processing job. And so the idea here is that they can recognize your sound card as you move from one page to another. And, uh, and there's a whole bunch of websites that, that have been caught using that library. Yes? You're mentioning scripts. Is all, are all of these things run through scripts? Like if you don't have them enabled, they just can't run? Question was, if you don't have JavaScript enabled, uh, can these things run? Um, most of them can't run because they're JavaScript APIs. Okay. That, that, I was that, wondering if you were just doing an yeah. example or it could only run through Pretty much on, only from JavaScript. There, there are a few exceptions, but yeah. Question, quick question. Yeah, so, sorry. So your this, this code is analyzing the sound card, not actually uh, playing the mic and detecting Correct. the ringtone or something. Yeah. Okay. Same question. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So when a website asks to turn on your camera, you get a notification. Like, I don't think it can turn on the camera without it. Yes. Can you turn on the mic without a notification on a laptop? So, um, the question was, can you turn on, like if you turn on, if it was, it, before a website can have access to camera, it needs to, to ask for permission. Can, is, is the microphone also something you need to ask for permission? For permission? Yes, and that's often the, the sort of worst APIs, if you, if you will, for, from a privacy point of view, uh, typically are exposed through permissions, like for example, geolocation. I'm, I'm not, I don't disable geolocation because every web page that wants to, lo to, to locate you in the world using the GPS, they need to ask for permission first, right? Like we recognize that obviously that's terrible. You can't just be broadcasting GPS coordinates to every web page out there. Um, for things like this, uh, often it's, it's APIs where we didn't realize until someone actually produced a working attack that those things might be dangerous. Um, so there's not there's not there's no permission prompt for all of these things. <coughs> Something else that was in the news recently um, is IDN spoofing. IDN is um, internationalized domain names, so basically domain names that have accented characters for non-English letters. Um, for example, this one. This looks an awful lot like a proprietary software company that many people know, right? But it is not actually apple.com. In fact, none of the letters in the middle are English letters. They're all um, Cyrillic letters, which are used, for example, in Russian. Uh, it looks an awful lot like Apple, don't, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it turns out that this is, this is a very difficult problem to solve if you actually care about people that don't speak English being able to use the web, 
right? Like if you if you were to say, well, oh, we'll just not have any sort of characters on the web, then this problem would not exist, right? We would not have these uh, these lookalike domains. Um, however, you know there are people that speak other languages than English uh, out there, and um, so we have to deal with this somehow. Now, so these are not English characters, but Cyrillic characters which look like the word Apple, like. All of these, like none of these are, are English letters. Yeah. Dot com is just normal C O M and uh, www as well. But the middle part is is Cyrillic. So if you use a search engine and enter it, it's not safe for it instead of entering on the name. Sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, <coughs> to to get I mean you do it either link sent by email or some some other way. So okay, in in an email, you could actually see this, and depending on your email client, it would also be displayed exactly like this. It all depends on the software whether or not they support uh, IDNs. And um, so in Firefox, there is a preference which you can set, and that will make the domains look like this. So this is uh, of course really ugly. But if you only speak English and you don't care about <coughs> seeing ugly URLs like these, then you can detect these spoof domains um, very easily, right? It doesn't look anything like Apple. Yes? For English letters, like if that actually was Apple.com, it would just show exactly the same, yes. right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so it's only if there are non English characters that you get the puny code, as, as it's called. Um, now, the one thing to note here is that spoofing in itself is not, is not necessarily a concern. The reason why that this site is not actually blocked in Firefox is because it's just a demonstration site. It's not actually a phishing site. It's not trying to steal your iTunes password or anything like that. We do have phishing protection in Firefox. And if this, if this were a phishing page, we would put it on the list and we would block it. So there's a difference between spoofing and phishing. Um, but if you only speak English, you can turn this on, and then you will never see uh, these things. Something else I, I like to, to disable is link <coughs> coloring. Now, link coloring is pretty useful, right? Like if you're reading a multi-page article, you might want to know that uh, the purple stuff is the stuff you've already, re already read, and then you can easily keep track of where you're at. It turns out, however, that if a page is able to put a bunch of links on the page and then read off the color of the links using JavaScript, then it could detect which sites you have visited before. Right? And so um, it could leak part of your browsing history, which it's not supposed to have access to. Now, that particular <coughs> attack we fixed years and years ago. So it's no longer possible to just write some JavaScript and directly read off the color. We, we lie about the color. We pretend it's always blue and that kind of stuff. But um, every couple of years, there's a more sophisticated attack that shows up and that allows people to actually get at that information. It's, it's a bit of a cat and mouse game. And ultimately, maybe we, we won't win. Because it's, if, if you, so like the latest attack, for example, has to do with how long it takes to uh, paint a uh, link in a different color. You know, how, how long does it take to paint a link in purple versus blue, and that kind of stuff. So it, it, it becomes really sophisticated. And at the end of the day, if you don't care about link coloring, uh, you can turn it off like this. And then you, you will be sure that this kind of information will never leak, no matter how clever the attacks. But you are losing something that's quite uh, useful as well. Something else that um, I like to disable, it has to do with the clipboard. Now, if you are a developer or a sysadmin, um, you will often see things like this. Now, it's pretty small, but basically it says to install this piece of software, copy and paste this uh, command here into a terminal, press enter, and then you know, the process will start. Maybe you've gone to uh, Stack Overflow and you've copied and pasted things into your terminal, right? Well, one thing to, that uh, might be useful to know is that the browser exposes an API that allows websites to know uh, when you've copied something into the clipboard. They get events, basically. The other thing that the browser allows the website to do is to copy something to the clipboard so that, for example, when you're on GitHub, if you click the little button, it will copy the, the clone URL into your clipboard uh, automatically, and then you can just paste it in the terminal. Right? So if you combine these two, what you get is basically you can detect when someone selects that text on your page and copies it to the clipboard. 
then you can immediately replace the text in the clipboard with the command of your choice, and then the person pastes it into their terminal. And if you include the return character at the end of the, in the clipboard, right, they don't even need to press enter. Um, so you can be tricked into pasting random things into your terminal. Very clever attack. This is how you disable this attack. You just prevent pages from being able to cop, cut and copy, basically. Web pages are never able to paste, right? Because otherwise they could, be, they could steal the contents of your, of your clipboard. But if you t disable this, then web pages are also not allowed to put stuff in your clipboard. Of course, that will disable the handleadable.com and GitHub and a bunch of other things. So it's up to you to uh, choose whether or not you want to disable these things. So does this prevent you from copying anything out of the web browser? No, no, you can still uh, copy and paste manually you know, okay. you know, using the clipboard or right clicking, you know, using you anything else. That thing that says, like, but the web page itself can't put stuff, can't inject stuff in your clipboard. Yep. Is that correct? I'm not seeing on uh, it, uh, it, it might depend on, uh, on your version of Firefox. Um, I think that was uh, somewhat recently added. Um, the, I mean, if you don't see it, the, 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 the ability to, to, for a site to cut a copy is not yet in the pure version of Firefox. So you're okay. I think. I can double check it. <laughs> um, Chromecasts, they work in mm -hmm. Firefox. Uh, if you have one in your house on your network, Firefox will be able to uh, stream things to them. Uh, in order to discover these devices automatically, it uses a networking protocol called SSDP. And uh, what that means is that it actually looks on the network for these things and uh, you know, looks for broadcast packets, that kind of stuff. <coughs> if you don't want your browser to be doing this because you actually never use these things, you don't own one, you can uh, disable it using this, this graph. Similarly, if you don't have one of these devices, VR headset, gamepad, or you don't ever intend to use them on the web, you can uh, turn them off. And that will actually reduce a little bit the fingerprintability of your browser. <coughs> because for example, uh, it, can, it, like, it might allow a web page to tell that you have a particular brand of, of uh, VR headset because they're all so very different. And so um, disabling that will hide this from web pages. Something else that I prefer to disable is the built-in PDF reader. Now, it's quite convenient if you read a lot of PDFs. Personally, I like to read them in an external reader. Um, one of the reasons there is that if there ever was some kind of uh, scripting attack inside a PDF, well, if I'm reading it in an external reader, there's no chance that that's going to get uh, steal cookies, for example, from my browser, because it's in a separate application. Um, but again, if you really like PDFs, and See uh, and, and read lots of them. Maybe that's not a good trade-off for you. That's the craft to disable this. This API here is uh, only available on Android, so it's a network information API. Uh, it's not even implemented on desktop, so don't worry about it if you uh, if you're uh, only on desktop. But it allows web pages to tell what kind of connection you're on. So, for example, the BBC will warn you uh, before you're about to watch a really large video if you're on data. Uh, and uh, Gmail might offer you a simplified uh, HTML version of their app if uh, they detect that you're on a very slow network, for example. Kind of handy. Um, this is the kind of information that it leaks out. The connection type, which is one of these, Bluetooth, cellular, Wi-Fi, that kind of stuff. And then the maximum speed. So this is not something the browser measures. It's the maximum theoretical speed for that kind of technology. So that allows a web page to essentially say, uh, this user is on a cellular 4G connection, 3G, something like this. So it's not particularly <coughs> revealing, but it does leak a little bit more information about you. Again, if you combine all of these information together, then you start to narrow it down to uh, individual users. So if you want to disable that, you can just disable the API like this. And then you don't get the warning if you're on data and you're about to watch a very large BBC video. But yeah, that's the <coughs> thing. Other things you might want to disable, um, these, uh, these APIs kind of provide uh, more uh, debugging information for um, like sites like YouTube, for example. So statistics, uh, how to optimize the experience for your particular device, that kind of stuff. It doesn't seem to affect playback too much, so I don't really mind disabling them. WebGL uh, gives uh, websites 
some um, information about the kind of GPU we have in Unity to help, again, with debugging, troubleshooting, that kind of stuff. And this last one is interesting. This is a high-resolution timer API. There's lots of uses for high-resolution timers, but the, the one that concerns me the most is that it speeds <coughs> up timing attacks. If you don't know what a timing attack is, it's fairly simple. Say you want to know whether uh, I have visited Fox News. What you might do is you might put a large image that's on the front page of Fox News right now on your web page, and then you time how long it took me to, uh, how, how long it, it took to basically finish loading the image, right? So if it took, I don't know, a few milliseconds, then it came from cache. I definitely went and visited that page before. Um, if it took, I don't know, three seconds, then it probably came from the network. And so you can uh, leak a little bit of, of information. In this case, have you been there or not using this, ti this timing attack? You don't need high resolution timers for that particular attack. Um, those attacks are extremely hard to, um, to uh, defend against, of course. Um, that, um, which is why the Tor browser, for example, has essentially separate caches for different web pages. So they don't want to be able, they, they, they don't want to allow you to be able to load things uh, quickly or slowly. Uh, they want to hide absolutely everything. But this API actually speeds <coughs> up timing attacks by giving the timers more, uh, more granular resolution. So there's a bunch of, of um, other attacks on different APIs that rely on this one to, uh, to actually work better. So that's why I disable it. Um, other features I don't want to disable entirely because I think they have a lot of value, but I like to uh, restrict them somewhat in what they can do because I think the defaults are a little bit too lax. So cookies, of course you all know what they are. If you disable them entirely, then there's a lot of stuff that doesn't work anymore. For example, logging into websites, right? So cookies are actually not something that's, that's practical to disable entirely. Um, and so those are the same settings that I use instead. The first one says accept all cookies all the time. And that includes first party cookies, the normal cookies, login cookies, that kind of stuff, but also third party cookies, which are most often used to track you for ads, <coughs> that kind of stuff. But they're also used by a lot of payment gateways. And it's really annoying when you have uh, payment gateways that don't work and they claim that your credit card was denied or something like that, whereas the, whereas the actual problem was that you rejected the cookie. Um, it's, really, it's really quite confusing and hard to debug. So I accept all third party cookies. But then the second pref says that, you, that I basically throw away all the third party cookies as soon as I close my browser. So I accept all of them, but they're very short lived. As soon as my browser is shut down, I clear all of these cookies. I don't clear all the cookies when I close my browser because that's, um, I mean, that's a little bit of a trade-off. You can clear all cookies if, if, you, if you like, but then you have to re-log into all your sites that, that you use every day, so that's a little bit annoying. Instead, what I do is I tweak the lifetime policy, and I, I give cookies a maximum lifetime of five days. For a normal site where you, that you visit every day, they will typically refresh the cookie. They'll just, every time you visit the page, they'll set a new cookie. And so ev each of these cookies will be a maximum of five days. As long as you come back to that site within five days, you're still logged in. If you don't come back for two weeks, then the cookie has expired and it's gone. Yes? Yeah, but you say you in, in the TD Bank or Toronto Dominion Bank, mm -hmm. at least mortgage application, they have some weird condition. We met, and it, it was not regarding tracking what we do on when by logged on to their uh, website or accounts, it was we may track your or we may track your browsing habits or history or something like that. Can can one cookie or two parties acting in concert find out where you visit? So the question is, can uh, if there are two parties that work with one another, can they find out where you visit? Um, like what, which websites you visit. Um, so I'll give you like the, the, the best example of this um, is uh, Google Analy Analytics. Google Analytics is, is uh, a tool that a lot of uh, websites use. I think I've seen estimates as large as 60 to 65% of websites use Google Analytics. They all load it and Google Analytics can set a cookie on your browser with a unique identifier. And so Google can watch 60% of the websites that you visit just because they have a cookie, a third-party cookie, 
and they're included on all of these unrelated pages. So, yes, that you can do you can do lots of tracking online, um, and that's why I, I recommend tracking protection um, because that will cut off the trackers that we know about in the US. If you want to know more about all of the press we have for cookies, there are a whole bunch more. Um, you can see the blog post that I uh, wrote about it. Something else I like to restrict uh, is called the refer, <coughs> sorry, the refer header. The refer header is pretty simple. It tells websites where you came from. So for example, uh, I'm reading uh, one of my own blog posts. And I've got the developer tools open here. And you, you can see. Um, at the bottom that there is this thing called refer and then a URL. So that actually tells that web page where you came from. Where were you when you clicked the link that led to your page, right? So it can tell lots of information. It can tell other uh, sites lots of information. For example, you know, if I'm reading an article on CNN and then I, I see Linux Fest, an ad for Linux Fest, I click on the ad, I get to the Linux Fest page, Linux Fest knows that I came from CNN and they know which article I read because they have the URL um, of the site I came from. This is why I like to set. Yes, question. Doesn't that prevent going back then? Does it prevent? Going back from the site. Oh, like does it disable the back button? Uh, no, this, the, the browser knows where you're going okay. and it doesn't need to share. So it's, it's explicitly sharing it with websites, which it doesn't need to do for the purposes of the back button. Um, I use this prep. And what it does is that it basically uh, sends the, the full refer if you're within a, a single site, right? So if I'm within CNN, CNN will be able to track me as I, as I read various articles on CNN. They could do that anyways using their server logs, so you're not actually giving up anything here. But cross-origin, which means different websites, they get nothing. So if I go from CNN to Linux Fest, Linux Fest does not see anything. They, they, uh, it's as if I had typed in the URL manually in the URL bar. So you want this to be set at one, not zero? One, yes. yes. So what, what is the advantage of, for five, like, why is that in Firefox that it's giving you that information out of person? Um, historical reasons mostly. Like, like the, so it, it, we, at the time, I, I suppose people didn't really think about it too much, and they thought it would be useful to keep track of this kind of information. And now there are so many systems that are built <coughs> on it that if you disable it entirely, like there's lots of things that break. For example, if you disable the refers entirely, you won't be able to log into the Ubuntu bug tracker or any kind of Django sites because they use the refer as a check to make sure that you you didn't. That there's there's um, login CSRF attacks. Um, I'm not going to get get into what they are. But you can check the refer, and that's one way to mitigate these kinds of attacks. If you, um, if you disable refer in, in entirely, you, that, that won't work, and you'll be basically faced with not being able to log into a bunch of places. If you disable it cross origin, that doesn't break the login flow. However, it does break a few things. Uh, there are some CDNs that enforce weird refer checks. Um, I added another um, uh, uh, preference in Firefox called uh, cross-origin trimming policy. And if you set that to two, uh, so you use one or the other. The second one breaks less websites, but it reveals a little bit more information than the first one. Um, the second one, what it does is that if I'm going from CNN to Linux Fast, it will tell Linux Fast I came from CNN, but it will just tell it CNN.com. It's not going to tell, it's not going to give a giveaway the path. It's going to uh, basically hide which article I was reading. Yes. So, uh, continuing this hypothetical, um, back in the 90s when this stuff was invented, right. when XFast would have used that information to determine was this a good use of their advertising dollars, advertising in CNN? That's a, the, so, so the, right now, a big user <laughs> of refers is, is ads, uh, ad networks. Yeah. That they, can, they can use that kind of stuff. But they have other mechanisms as well, well because that, they're, they're running arbitrary JavaScript on your computer all the time. Does Google so. Analytics get that information? But yeah, online. Google and Analytics will, will get really, answered. When I click on the Linux Fest, I'd like them to just get an anonymous one vote of approval saying, yeah, this was a good use of advertising. And, that, and that's what you can get with the second okay. prep. Can you remove the Google Analytics? Is it just a cookie? If you want to remove Google Analytics entirely, like just enable tracking protection, and it will be blocked. Yeah. Just to be clear, were you saying that you should choose one of these to set and not 
one or the other. Yeah, the, the top one is the strongest one. That's the one that I use. And the second one is it, it, it breaks uh, fewer things, basically. And uh, I wrote a blog post about this as well, if you want to explore more of the refer options that we have uh, in Firefox. Um, another thing that I, that I want to talk about a little bit is uh, safe browsing. Not because I choose to disable any of it myself. I think it's, it's actually really useful technology and it protects our users um, quite a lot. But uh, because there's lots of advice on the internet that misunderstands a little bit how that feature works. So safe browsing is what you see, uh, or is what powers these kinds of warnings. If you visit a phishing site, um, <coughs> you may see something like this. The site is blocked because it's a, a known phishing site. Or uh, you may see this if you uh, visit a web page that serves malware, for example. Or this for a website that visits something uh, that, 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 that um, tries to get you to install something called potentially unwanted software, which is uh, kind of malware, but not really. It's, it, it's sort of borderline because it will be something like a video codec that also comes with ad injections. It changes your default browser or you know, adds refer mm -hmm. like referral links to your Amazon uh, links, that kind of stuff. So it does undesirable things on your computer. But it also does something that you want, so it's, it's sort of a bo this borderline case. All of these um, uh, warnings are powered by a service that Google runs called, called Safe Browsing. And it works by um, relying on pre-downloaded -download lists of URL hash prefixes. What does that mean? It means that the browser will not send every URL that you visit to Google to check if it's safe or not. Instead, every half hour, it downloads a new list. And it's not a list of, uh, of just the bad URLs directly, because that would be a gigantic list. As you might imagine, there's lots of bad stuff on the internet. Um, instead, it's uh, a list of, of hashes. So for example, if my blog were a phishing site, it wouldn't be listed like this. It would be listed like this. It's the cryptographic hash of that, the SHA-256 hash. And then it's not e it, we wouldn't even ship the full hash. We would just ship the first byte. So that's actually what's in the browser, lists of things like this. And so it's, it's purely a, um, a list-based uh, thing. It's not an online lookup with Google. Uh, if you want to know more about that part of safe browsing, you can read all the details on my blog. Again, I've tried to dispel some of the myths there uh, with safe browsing. Um, but there is another component to safe browsing as well, which, uh, which uh, is slightly different. So it has slightly different uh, privacy guarantees. And that has to do with downloading executable files. So executable files are files like these, you know, the usual suspects. And uh, if you want to see the full list, <coughs> I've got a, a link to the actual source code where you can see all of the files that we consider executable and therefore subject to these uh, extra checks. And essentially, what happens is that when you download one of these files, we will uh, do a few, few more checks on it. We will send some metadata about it to a Google service, and then they will tell us if it's, uh, if it's safe, if it's unsafe, or if it's kind of in the middle, we're not too sure about it. Um, we don't send the actual file. It's not a virus scanning service. We just send some of this information here. You can see exactly in our source code what kind of information we sent. Um, we realize that this is stuff that not everybody wants. And so we actually have more preferences in Firefox to control the various aspects of safe browsing. The first one, block dangerous and deceptive content, those are the, the page, the big red pages that you've seen uh, that's, that's entirely based on pre-downloaded pre lists. Um, so I, I highly recommend that you leave that one enabled. The second one is about downloads specifically, so just a download component. If that's the part that you're not comfortable with, you can choose to disable just that. And then the, the third one is about uh, if, if you don't actually want these uh, warnings about uncommon software or unwanted software, you can disable that as well. But because you're power users, I can mention another setting, which um, if you object to only the part of safe browsing that, set, that submits metadata back to Google for the purposes of determining whether one of these executable files is uh, dangerous, then you can turn off only the remote lookup and leave the rest of safe browsing intact. So we will still use the, the list. We will block things that we know are bad. 
but we will not do that uh, extra lookup at the end. And again, more details in light log if you want to know exactly how this stuff works. Yes? One quick question. Um, you mentioned that you cut off the first part of SHA. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens if it hits one of those? Does it try and like get the full thing to see if it's a duplicate, or does it just assume that that's, if you got part of it, it's probably bad? So the question is, if you're cutting off the, the, if you're only keeping the first part, you may have collisions. More than one thing might map to the same hash. What do you do then? Uh, the answer is a noise blog post. But, okay. uh, but the, the, sh the short of it is that we actually go and download the full, the, we, we basically ask the server, like, which, which hashes do you have? Let's start with this. And we download the, the list of hashes. And we put a couple of other fake ones to, make, to hide the, 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 yeah. the real one that you're actually looking up. Uh, and then at that point, not, n you have, not only do you have the, the first part in your local list, but you also have the full ones. All right, WebRTC. Something else that, um, that I choose to restrict, but not disable entirely, because I think WebRTC is our best bet at uh, <laughs> moving away from proprietary video conferencing software like this into uh, something where we can have an end-to-end -end encrypted connection with uh, anybody else uh, on the internet because browsers support it. I think that's pretty awesome. Now, in order to have to create a peer-to-peer -peer connection between you and the other uh, person in the uh, video call, uh, we need to use a protocol called ICE to establish the connection. And the simplified version of how that works is that each uh, side of the connection looks at all the networks they can talk to, so they look at their IP addresses, and then they share that with each other so that they can pick the best one, basically the fastest link between the two. Unfortunately, this uh, sharing means that if you're behind a VPN and you share all of your IP addresses with the other end, then you actually share the IP address that you may be trying to hide. Not ideal. Um, good news is that's fixed in <coughs> Firefox 51. Um, that was recognized as a privacy problem, and, uh, and it's no longer a, a concern. The only remaining concern is your, about your internal IP address. So say you're at a company, they have a uh, NAT firewall, and you're behind that public IP address. Everybody in the company is behind the same public IP address. Well, internally, you have 192.168.1.10 style IP addresses, right? WebRTC will leak these. Now, you might think it's not a big concern because it's not, there's not really anything uh, personal about this, these non-routable internal IP addresses. But if you have both, right, if you have the external IP address and the internal one, then your NAT is no longer providing any sort of privacy for you because you can pinpoint exactly which computer inside the company is the one talking to this website. So if you want to disable this, um, of course, if you disable this, um, it will prevent you from having uh, video conferences with people on the same internal network. Um, you can flip uh, this setup here. And that keeps the rest of um, WebRTC. You'll still be able to make calls on the internet, that kind of stuff. But you're not leaking your internal IP address. Finally, the uh, last thing I want to mention in, in this section is something that comes to us from Tor. Right now uh, at Mozilla, we have a couple of engineers that are busy uplifting all of the patches that Tor adds to Firefox. So all of the things they have fixed, all of the extra features they, they're adding into their version of Firefox. We're adding this uh, into Firefox. And the hope is that we will be able to enable or expose some of this technology to our uh, users as well. One of the ones that's available right now if you go into about config, is privacy that resists fingerprinting. This is a collection of tricks that Tor plays in order to mess with people that are doing fingerprinting. Um, it's pretty safe to, um, I've been testing it for maybe a year. It's, it seems to not really break anything. Um, so I kind of like to do it. They will do things like lie about the fonts that might be installed on your machine, um, lie about the color set, pretend that you're you know, to some extent, pretend that you're a really boring Windows computer or something like this. Um, because that's the approach that Tor takes to fingerprinting in general. They just pretend that everybody has the same exact computer. Um, now, a few other things to keep in mind before I close. Um, passwords, if you're storing them in the password manager in Firefox, make sure you set a master password. Because otherwise, someone that gets access to your computer can just 
get your password database and look at all of your unencrypted passwords. If you set a master password, then the, the, the local database will be encrypted. If you're using Firefox Sync to sync your passwords across devices, um, that's good. It's end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, however, make sure you use a strong password. Because if you don't, that's what the encryption actually relies on. If you use a weak password, then the encryption key will be very weak, and then someone can brute force that and potentially steal your passwords. If you don't want to save your passwords in the browser and then sync them across, you can also use this uh, a technique called password generators. This is an example of a password generator. A password generator. This one is written by the author of Adblock Plus. And the way that it works is that you type in the master password after you install the extension, and then it uses that password and the URL of the site you're on, hashes them together in order to generate a unique password for every different website, because every website has a different address, so the, the, the resulting password will be different. And so what that means is that you can um, basically log into all these websites, typing in the same master password. Every website gets a different one. Uh, different underlying passwords, so if they, get a, if they get compromised, then it doesn't matter. It's only that site that's compromised. They can't go and, and, and find all of your uh, other accounts uh, automatically. And if you reinstall the, uh, re the add-on in a different browser, you type, as long as you type in the same master password, then uh, every, everything will be fine. You, they will generate the same passwords. Speaking of add-ons, here's a couple that I like to install in my browser as well. Uh, HTTPS Everywhere is an add-on by the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Basically, has a giant list of websites that are available over HTTPS, and it will prevent you from connecting to those over HTTP. Even if you type in HTTP, it will actually upgrade you automatically to HTTPS. So it's pretty cool. HTTPS by default is there to uh, change the default protocol if you don't type it in. So if you type in www.linuxfast.org. Normally, it goes to HTTP because that's the default, and then Linux Fast may redirect you to the HTTPS version. If you have this extension, it goes straight to HTTPS. The, the default is HTTPS, if you, unless you specify HTTP explicitly. Um, I like it, but you will, find, uh, you will find, if you install this, that there's a bunch of websites that have broken HTTPS configurations. So it's kind of fun to see which ones are doing it right, which ones are not. Privacy Badger is a tracking protection extension. It um, does a similar thing to tracking protection, except that it doesn't use a list. Instead, it looks at uh, heuristics. It looks for signs of tracking, and then it builds its own list based on what it has detected. Next one is NoScript. NoScript disables JavaScript all, everywhere, and it keeps it disabled until you have explicitly whitelisted a site. So this is an add-on for people that like pain and uh, inconvenience, uh, because the first week that you install this, it's, it's pretty horrible. It, nothing works. You have to build up your whitelist, and then eventually it starts to work again. You know, after two weeks, then the, the internet is, is, is usable again. But the great thing about this is that if you visit like, a random site, phishing site, anything like this, right, a place you've never been before that you haven't whitelisted, then JavaScript is disabled. So in order for a phishing site to be able to run some JavaScript um, on the page, then it needs to convince you to whitelist them. Right? So mm -hmm. the, the default protection is quite nice. And if you like to, uh, to, to have very inconvenient add-ons and you like to micromanage your uh, browsing experience, <coughs> then request policy is for you, because that takes the NoScript idea one step further. It blocks all third-party connections. Which means that, for example, if you have a site that displays images from a CDN, then it's not going to display anything until you whitelist from this site to this CDN, allow the connection. Right? Th so this is much more painful than this <laughs> script. Uh, I really like it, though, because uh, this essentially eliminates all third-party tracking, right? because it disables all third-party connections. So you have to manually whitelist trackers if you want to be tracked uh, with this thing. However, lots of things break when you do that, including payment gateways and those kinds of things. So um, beware before you install uh, something like this. Finally, I want to give a shout out to this project, the user.js project on GitHub. Um, user.js is a file that you can drop into your uh, Firefox profile directory, 
and then it will set all of uh, the settings for you automatically. Everything is contained in the user.js. And this community has uh, essentially created this giant list of, of uh, annotated list of all of the preferences in Firefox that have some kind of link to security and privacy. And they have very good comments. And so basically, you can take that file, read through, pick the settings that, that seem interesting, try them out for yourself, make your own version of, the, of that file, and then use it in all of your browsers. I wouldn't recommend using the file directly because it breaks a lot of stuff and it mm. disables all kinds of things. But it's really a nice read. Uh, and you know, if you're interested in the new stuff, these guys actually look at every single Firefox release and all the new things that we add. So and they examine everything quite uh, closely. This is my user.js file. And it has all of the props that I've talked about uh, today. And I'm happy to take any questions if you have them. Yes. Is there a list on? Uh, is there a list somewhere on Mozilla's site of all the preferences and a description of what they do? Because I've I've been looking for it in the past and haven't been able to get a very good description. I can get like the names of all of them, but what they actually do is a bit cryptic. Mm. Um, the short answer is no. Um, mm. The slightly longer answer is um, the, in our source code, the, there is one file where all the prefs are defined. And that usually has some pretty good comments for most of them, not all of them. Okay. But other than that, you often have to like actually look at where that pref is used in the source code. I have to do that all the time. Like, What does this even do? And that, so, but you do, that's why the user J, the JS project is really interesting, because these people actually do that work, and then they, they add comments in, in their file. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. Yes. A uh, few, few days back or a week or two back, there was a comment about Uber having some unique identifier that they put on Apple phones that even if the phone was wiped clean, they could still track the user or right. they could still track the ID. Uh, so if the OS is wiped clean, do they do something in the boot? The question is about um, Uber and how they are tracking users on um, on Apple uh, phones even after people uninstall the app. Um, I don't remember exactly what the what what mechanism they were using there. I did I did see the the article, um, but I think that's very specific to to iOS, and so it wouldn't be. Um, yeah, there's nothing in Firefox that we can talk about that. Yeah. Any other questions? Yep. Yeah. To to which one so to? Allow a cookie for domain basically, and now it's oh right right. So what yeah. was the rationale behind that? Why did Firefox you know? I I think so. The 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 general rationale for for things like that is that sometimes we have security preferences that cause more trouble than than they seem to be worth because users get into really bad situations where they enable them, they forget they've enabled these settings, and then everything breaks, and then they, they just think their browser is broken, and they get a new one. Um, so like, that, this is kind of the problem I was talking at the beginning. Like, there's lots of things I would like to see in Firefox. Sometimes it's hard to actually get there. Um, and sometimes you know, we're, we're, we're pushing against the people that are trying to make the usability better. So. Yeah, it would be it would be nice if we could actually have a way to restrict cookies a lot more than they are restricted right now. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe something like no scripts for cookies would be quite quite nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. On your uh, five day cookie lifetime, does that extend the the cookie, or do, does it actually expire? So it, the, it makes it expire after five days. It makes it yeah, maximum. Expire. Yeah. It doesn't extend until. This a site can actually like set a new cookie, like so, so they can effectively renew the cookie for like as long as you're visiting that site, 
that if you need to visit the site, right? If you don't visit the site for six days, right. then, then the cookie is gone. All right, I think we're out of time. Thank you very much. If you have more questions, thank you.